Now for the scripture reading, I told my grandpa, I said, man, you come up with the craziest sermon names, a watermelon in a cotton field. So while we ponder the name and reading the Holy Scripture, would y'all please rise? <laughs> the first one comes from Ecclesiastes 2.22. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? Second one comes from Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8. For everything there is a reason and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pick up what was planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear, a tear, and a time to sow. A time to keep silence, and a time to speak. A time to love, and a time to hate. A time for war, and a time for peace. And lastly, let's go to the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers... Be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of your Lord, knowing that the Lord your labor that excuse me, knowing that in the Lord your labor is never in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I had a lot of people tell me that I uh, didn't uh, follow the theme for today, dressing well, as a fisherman. I said, this is what I wear when I go fishing. <laughs> well, I'm glad Colin at least read the name of the sermon. We'll see if he understands it after I explain it. Have you ever been in a situation where you found yourself in a fruitless endeavor, you gave all that you had to a project and in the end nobody really seemed to care. Have you ever found yourself in a never-ending task that made you feel like you were on a treadmill that somebody had run up to high speed? getting you nowhere fast, leaving you exhausted, frustrated, and perhaps even a little bit bitter. I've known some women. <laughs> I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have paused. <laughs> now, after that rude interruption, I've known some women, ladies, females, who in the routine of motherhood and uh, being a wife, a housewife, pleased her to the entire family, rarely receiving compliments, encouragement, or appreciation. And to be fair, you husbands, me included, who work at a job providing the very best that you can for your family and feeling more and more that you can't get enough together to please the boss or to please the family, or feeling that there are few hours in the day, too few hours in the day to accomplish what you have to do. 
Sometimes the weather doesn't cooperate. And then there is time, too often, when we feel that as husbands and providers we have our backs up against the financial wall and the whole thing is closing in on us in greater debt. Now, what a way to start a sermon. But just so that you don't think that this is just 21st century kind of frustration, I want you to go sometime to the book of Ecclesiastes as was some of the some of the sermon, uh, some of the scripture lesson this morning, and read the very first chapters, the very first verses of that book. I'll share with you a couple of them. What do people gain from their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come, generations go, but the earth remains. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never sees enough, nor the ear hear enough. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Now, those words you would think are expressions of frustration from perhaps a slave of the time or somebody who is certainly on a low pay scale, poor citizen. No, not at all. Interestingly, they are the lament of the king of Israel, who you think has everything he needs and wants, and if he doesn't have it, he can get it. To put it mildly, he was having himself a giant pity party and uh, a happening I've been a part of and you have too if you be honest with me from time to time. You're trying to get ahead in your work, whatever that work may be. doesn't make any difference if you're in the industrial, if you're in the financial, if you're in the corporate or if you're out plowing the field hoping that things work for you. And you feel like you're taking two steps forward and one back. Now maybe you have teenagers. I'm not leaving anybody in the family out. <laughs> Who themselves are finding life, finding themselves in life, experimenting, testing the waters, if you will, <coughs> learning, and in the process driving us up the wall. <laughs> You may find yourself in a dead-end job that has become a smothering tunnel. And you look and there is no light at the end. And in defense of the teens, because they bruise easily, you understand, it seems like they have been going to school all their life, wondering what is algebra ever going to do for me? <laughs> How am I ever going to be able to speak Spanish if I move to New York? <laughs> or, you know, you add your own. And then somebody, what is saying to them, in order to get ahead, you need to go to college, more school. Or you need to go to a trade school and learn a skill, more time spent in the classroom. What is all this studying and testing doing for us? Perhaps you're trapped in a marriage or a relationship that's stifling your creativity as an individual and pushing you further and further away from the love that you think ought to be there instead. Now, it's not my intent to judge anybody. I'm simply wanting to be a mirror to the fact that these are situations of reality in our lives. And I want you to take a moment to reflect upon where your life is going and uh, offer encouragement that will enable you to get to the end of that encouraged journey, having realized what you want to do 
and what God has created you for. When I was a kid, that was a long time ago, I wanted to make money. And you might uh, think and know, <clears throat> know that jobs then were few and far between and didn't pay diddly. So I remember a couple of jobs that I'll share with you as if I fondly put them down in my life journal. I didn't. <laughs> but some of you will know the pleasures of what I went through. I remember one summer I chopped cotton. Now, some of you look at me and say, what? Ask your fathers, your grandfathers. They'll know if they were cotton farmers. They'll know what it was back when to chop cotton. I was happy to get the job. I'd stand at that row to begin my work with my hoe in my, la my hands, and I swear I couldn't see the end of the row. It was so long and the sun was so hot in South Texas that I know that it had something to do with uh, estimating distances. They seemed like at least two miles long. But when I reached the end of the row and then turned around to do another one and so forth, in the end of the day, I finally was able to add up the rows down which I walked to chop the cotton I was paid Ten cents a row. I took the money and happily left. It was my money. I earned it. And the other labor of love that I want to share with you those days of, uh, of my youth, I was asked to sit in a semi downtown of a small near coastal Texas town and sell the watermelons that were there for 50 cents a piece. 50 cents a piece. Now, it wasn't a hard job to, to do that by any estimation, but in the midst of my daydreaming between the times that the rush was not there to buy them at 50 cents a piece, I thought what my buddies were doing without me, out there having fun, playing baseball, going fishing, whatever, and I was stuck in that hot, sweltering Texas heat. But I got through it. And at the end, and almost all the watermelons gone, I earned three dollars. <laughs> There's a better story about the days of picking cotton by hand. And this is told by a lady who is older now but at that time was a part of brothers and sisters in a family that had a family farm where they grew cotton and on that fa family farm they had to do everything from planting to uh, to harvesting and so they had to go out as a family pick the cotton now if you never looked at a cotton bowl that's the nastiest thing there ever lived. It's sharp in its edges, it's, it'll poke you, and you have to reach into that plant and pick that cotton out of the center of that bowl again and again while your back is aching and your hands are bleeding and getting red. The family was marching down the row, parallel rows, all together so that father and mother could see the kids and all of a sudden one day daddy says look look what I found here and come on over here and look at this thing and they did and there was a big old plump green fat watermelon <laughs> right between the cotton rows so they sat down and they enjoyed it and the lady says, I remember I thought that was a miracle for that watermelon to have just shown up in the cotton field like that. They sat there devouring the juicy sweet melon. They were refreshed. They had a whole new attitude for the rest of the day and they went on and finished the job and day after day until the job of getting the cotton in. There was opportunity to find many other watermelons 
Why? Because the Father, it wasn't a miracle. The Father had planted watermelon seeds. And when he planted the cotton in strategic places, because he knew that life for a kid then was tough. And it was hard for them with everybody else to have to go out there, bloody their hands, make their backs ache for the family. I hope you begin to see why the title comes from, where the title comes from. As author of Hebrews says, <clears throat> says, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus. Now there's another story of a lady now who as a teenager she remembers she was on the cross country track team in high school and the coach would make them run barefoot on the beach as they're training. Now you can well imagine what noises were coming from the lips of those teenagers. It was difficult. You ever try to run in sand? It was absolutely impossible, especially to get any kind of feeling of speed, which of course was their aim. So they, we would say, belly ached and whined and complained the entire time until the first competition. And they were so far out of everybody, they were happy. They had won the race hands down. And she says the constant fighting and struggling barefoot through the soft shifting sand had forced us to become conscious of every step, to quickly steady our footing, to toughen up and push through the pain and resistance. And when that resistance was finally removed, the race was won and so was the victory. <clears throat> it can become discouraging when the tough parts of life, or school, or work, or marriage, or illness, you name it, place resistance in our path and impede our progress. And we do stop and wonder, why does God put this resistance in front of us if he wants us to succeed? <clears throat> If there was a handbook that a brand new baby like this one were given at the beginning of life and in the fly leaf of that handbook was signed by God the Creator, it would have to say, life ain't easy. Just to get him ready. But what is always available, and herein is the good news. What is always available in spite of and because of life's resistances is the love of a heavenly father who understands those he has created and knows what he wants those creations to be. Who constantly plants watermelons in the cotton field, if you will. <laughs> To give us refreshment, rest, assurance, direction, and content, uh, upon continuing the journey. To know by faith that there is rest, assurance, and direction our lives can take through those times of resistance that will surely come. There is help that will make the journey sweeter more rewarding than ever we could imagine having done it all by ourselves. If we'll take the time to rest in God, be quiet and at peace and allow him to speak through answered prayer, we can look down that long row where we are asked to labor with the hole in our hand and the distance is so far and we can see new purpose and new attitude 
and a new faith. And a new and brighter light will show the way toward what God the Creator wants us to be. Jeremiah can say it better than I ever hoped to. One of my most favorite scriptures. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Let us pray. We believe that you are that kind of father who understands that life ain't easy. But you so equip us for all the resistances that come to us and we're grateful. Our prayer is simply this. Continue through the Holy Spirit to give us the resistance to push on. In the name of Jesus, amen.